and commemoration of the San Remo Conference. This was in fact the European Belfort Declaration, just as important from an historic perspective. Many underplay the role of this significant conference. Therefore, we must continue to echo this historical event and its ramifications on the only Jewish state. We will have President Rivlin, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and U.S. Ambassador David Friedman participate and speak in this unique virtual conference. Join us now for this special broadcast. Hello and welcome to this special presentation on the 100th anniversary of the San Remo Resolution. I'm Chris Mitchell, the Bureau Chief for CBN News here in Jerusalem and your host for this broadcast produced by the European Coalition for Israel, ECI, and the Forum for Cultural Diplomacy. These organizations are dedicated to promoting closer relations and understanding between Israel and Europe to confronting anti-Semitism supporting peaceful coexistence between Jews and Arabs, and also to promote better inclusion of Israel and the Jewish people into the community of nations. This program is all part of that vision. You might not realize it, but 100 years ago in the small town of San Remo on the Italian Riviera, one of modern Israel's most significant events took place, the signing of the San Remo Resolution. At that time, after World War I, the great powers of the day recognized that the Jewish people had a legitimate right to the land, then known as Palestine. However, this profound geopolitical event has often been ignored or unrecognized by world leaders and the media. On this program, we'll hear from international law experts, top diplomats, and those who are making the San Remo Resolution a centerpiece in the debate over the Jewish people's right to the land of Israel. The European Coalition for Israel and the Forum for Cultural Diplomacy plan to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the resolution in San Remo itself. However, because of the global coronavirus pandemic, like most other events around the world, the gathering had to be postponed. But here's a personal greeting and message from the mayor of San Remo. Greeting to you all. Shalom. Aleichem. My name is Alberto Biancheri, and I am the mayor of San Remo. Exactly 100 years ago, our small and beautiful town was at the center of the world history. It was the place where leaders met to rebuild the world following the devastation of World War I. They met in San Remo, Villa de Vashan, in 1920, from April 19 to April 26. And it was here they decided that the people of the Middle East, both Arab and Jews, had the right to self-determination, paving the way for the creation of their nation states. For this reason, San Remo is rightly understood as the birthplace of the state of Israel. And so our town holds a very special place in Jewish history. You can come and discover more about these momentous events by looking at the unique archives we have on display at the special San Remo Resolution exhibition, which our town hosts. San Remo may be a small town, but it has a long and important history as a center of international relations, politics, and diplomacy. This tradition is still alive today with the activity of the International Institute of Human Rights, which is housed in the magnificent Villormont. Of course, San Remo is already known for the Italian Song Festival, for its flowers, which are exported all over the world. And just as San Remo was a perfect for world leaders to meet a century ago, so also our town today continues to combine the best that Italy has to offer. San Remo boasts a unique combination of beautiful landscapes, historical villas, elegant gardens, as well as high-class hotel, famous cuisine, typical Italian hospitality, and one of the most beautiful seaside promenade and bike lanes in Europe. 
Sanremo and all the Liguria region offer visitors and rich historical and cultural experience which invite you to explore and discover. Dear friends from Israel and friends of Israel, we should all be in Sanremo today to celebrate together the centenary of the historic signing of the Sanremo Resolution, an event of great international significance. However, unfortunately, this is not possible. Because as we all know, Italy and many other countries are facing the dramatic health emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. But one day, and hopefully soon, this pandemic will be over and we can all return to the normal life and even travel. And when that day comes, it will be my pleasure to welcome you to our beautiful town. Dear friends, I look forward to meet you soon. I cannot wait to offer you the hospitality of our community. A big hug from San Remo. Ten years ago, the European Coalition for Israel hosted a gathering in San Remo on the 90th anniversary. This reporter had the privilege of covering that event. Thomas Sandel, the founder of ECI, organized that event, and it was attended by then Israeli Knesset member Danny Danone. He's now Israel's ambassador to the United Nations. Here's a clip of the report CBN News did following that meeting about the significance of the San Remo Resolution. Before its defeat in World War I, the 400-year-old Ottoman Empire spread throughout the Middle East. In San Remo, England, France, Italy, and Japan, along with the United States as an observer, divided the empire into three mandates, Iraq, Syria, and Palestine. France would oversee Syria, while Iraq and Palestine fell under Great Britain. The resolution also included the Balfour Declaration, written by England's Lord Balfour in 1917, which called for the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. One English diplomat, Lord Curzon, called it Israel's Magna Carta. This legal right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel has been little understood in the world. It's why ECI founder Thomas Sandel felt a duty to bring these historical facts to the table and make them a centerpiece of the international debate surrounding Israel. It's also why the documentary film Give Peace a Chance was produced after the 90th anniversary. Here's an excerpt. Yes. United Kingdom. Abstain. The United States. Yes. Resolution of the Duck yes. Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. Resolution 181 in the United Nations General Assembly in 1947 paved the way for the rebirth of the State of Israel in 1948. However, did this give Israel legitimacy? The answer is no. Generally speaking, in international law, General Assembly resolutions are not binding. It's a, a, a wide myth. There is absolutely no truth that Israel's legal foundation is based on the UN Partition Resolution of uh, November 29, 1947. If the Jewish people and the Arabs had agreed to enter into a treaty based on the terms of resolution, then rights and obligations could have been created in international law. But that didn't happen. The legal foundation of modern Israel really is initially traced back to the period right after the First World War, when the great powers at the time and the League of Nations, which was the UN of the that particular period, had to decide what's going to happen to various former enemy territories. Howard Grief began practicing law in 1966. For many years, even before that, he had an interest in Middle East affairs. In the 1980s, he began to examine long hidden documents in the British National Archives that minuted the San Remo Conference of 1920. As a result, he published the book, The Legal Foundation and Borders of Israel Under International Law. The San Remo Resolution 
That is the basic constitutional document of the State of Israel under international law. San Remo, the Villa de Vacha. This is the place where legal rights were granted. This is the place where legal rights were given to both the Jewish people and the Arab people. Dr. Jacques Gauthier is an international human rights lawyer. For more than 25 years, his focus has been the legal status of Jerusalem under international law, which was the subject of his doctoral thesis. It's in this place that the leaders with the power to make binding dispositions with respect to the Ottoman territories deliberated and made the decision having heard claims from the Zionist organization in Paris in 1919 during the Paris Peace Conference, having heard submissions from the Arab delegation in respect to what they wanted in the Ottoman territories, having heard these submissions, a group of them gathered here and made final binding decisions in international law as to who would get what. At San Remo, that what had been exclusively a British approach receives the full backing of the international community. And in that sense, uh, Israel's legitimacy is linked to an international decision at San Remo and not just a whim of British policy. In 1917, Lord Allenby conquered the Holy Land and the Jews were promised a national home in Palestine by the Earl of Balfour, a policy endorsed by Woodrow Wilson and by the League of Nations, which made Palestine a British mandate. In the 1922 Palestine Mandate, the League of Nations together voted on a very special resolution. It decided that they would give recognition to the historic rights of the Jewish people. To do what? To reconstitute their national home. Now, if you look at that language, you see two things. You see they are recognizing a pre-existing right and not creating a new right. In other words, the historical rights of the Jewish people to this land were recognized by the great powers at the time, by the equivalent of the UN at the time. It was the Jewish people that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust, a mandate under the care of the British government in respect to Palestine. It was the in Arab inhabitants of the territories of Mesopotamia, Iraq now, Syria and Lebanon that were chosen to be the beneficiaries of a trust or a mandate. Part of it under the trusteeship of or mandate of the French, Syria and Lebanon, part of it under British supervision Mesopotamia. I want to underline that the primary objective of the mandate for Palestine was to grant political rights and respect to Palestine to the Jewish people. The civil and religious rights of the Arabs as individuals were fully protected in the uh, mandate document. But insofar as the national and collective rights and the collective political rights uh, uh, were concerned. These were reserved exclusively for the Jewish people because uh, the Arabs were given those same rights not in Palestine but in the neighboring countries. And that is why today you have 21 Arab states and one Jewish state. The Second World War brought about the demise of the League of Nations. It was superseded by the United Nations in 1945. The Charter of the United Nations, which you are now signing, is a solid structure upon which we can build for a better world. How does this affect the rights of the Jewish people under international law? In the final resolution passed by the League in April of 1946, it is specified that the intent is that after the dissolution of the League, it is necessary to continue to look after the well-being and the development of the people concerned in each mandate. And for Palestine, that meant the Jewish people. 
So the rights that were recognized as inhering in the Jewish people uh, were preserved by Article 80. There's nothing in the Charter which is to be construed in or by itself as taking away or altering the rights given to any people prior to the establishment of the United Nations. And I refer, for instance, to Article 80 of the Charter. One of the experts who has understood the significance of San Remo is former Israeli ambassador to the UN, Dory Gold. Gold is now the director of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and he joined me here in our studio to discuss the importance of the San Remo Resolution. Ambassador Gold, we've just seen a uh, part of the documentary film, Give Peace a Chance, and your own words were in that. Uh, is there anything you'd want to add uh, after uh, viewing that? I think we're in a period, the last, I don't know, five, ten years, where our adversaries, the adversaries of Israel, have been trying to deny Israel its legitimacy. It has no right to be here. If it's here, it's just because it was strong enough to defeat its enemies. I think what the film does and what the reference to San Remo does is it shows, that in fact, the creation of a Jewish national home was widely backed by the international community way back then. Mm. So going back 10 years, that documentary came out about 10 years ago. Has anything changed diplomatically the status uh, of the state of Israel? Well, there are a number of important changes. I think the most important one is the election of Donald Trump as president of the United States. Whatever people thought of the Trump administration at the very beginning, with respect to Israel, he's been its greatest defender. With respect to Jerusalem, with respect to the Golan Heights, and with respect to the security of the state. Um, and there may be others out there who will join him in his positions. But right now, that stands out for most Israelis. Hmm. Ten years ago, you were concerned about a unilateral declaration of a Palestinian state. Uh, and what has changed in those ten years in, in that regard? There still is a danger that the Palestinians will go the unilateral track. And the um, Oslo agreements are pretty specific about this, That's, that the parties are not supposed to uh, undertake unilateral initiatives. Uh, obviously, if the Palestinians do that, Israel will have to protect its interests in Judea and Samaria, in the West Bank, in parallel. Mm, yeah. In the last 10 years, has the signing of the San Remo Resolution had anything to do with the diplomatic status of, uh, of Israel? People remember that there was a Paris Peace Conference. People remember that after World War II, there were Geneva Conventions signed, which affected international diplomacy for decades. But who remembers San Remo? It's not exactly out there as, a, um, as an issue that most people recall. But that's part of the, Israel's problem. Why is it that it's fighting for its legitimacy all the time? It's because the international treaties and agreements on which the state of Israel is based have been forgotten. Hmm. So I think it's the role of every diplomat. And I was the head of the foreign ministry for a period of time. Our role is to remind the international community what are Israel's legal rights? What is the basis for the legitimacy of the modern Jewish state? And for that, San Remo is pivotal. Mm. And here we are on the 100th anniversary of the signing of the San Remo uh, resolution. What can be done to make that more prominent in, uh, in the diplomatic world? Well, in 1920, they didn't have social media. But in uh, 2020, they do. And so part of what a good diplomat has to do is educate, educate his followers, educate the international community. That's what I tried to do when I was the ambassador of Israel at the United Nations. But I think we have to do it now with much greater intensity mm. than we ever did before. So do you see an opportunity right now in the 100th anniversary of the signing? Well, it, it might provide an opportunity 
but it really depends on the hard work of diplomats. You know, uh, a good diplomat 100 years ago was measured by his ability to write a good, concise cable. A good diplomat today is measured by his ability to protect his country's rights on national television. And taking that into account, mm. that is what uh, Israelis are going to have to do in the future far more than they ever did in the past. Mm. So would you say the world community or the international community has learned the lessons of San Remo or is there much wor more work to be done? There's a lot more work to be done now. But uh, the places where that work should be concentrated are places like universities. You know, I'm not worried about the students because the students are open to listening to both sides of an issue. I'm worried sometimes about the professors. And that is something that Israeli diplomats, Israeli ex-diplomats are going to have to focus on in the next period of time as we move from the 100th anniversary of San Remo forward. Hmm. You know, when I was reading about that period in history, we have a, a mandate for Syria, we have a mandate for Iraq, we have a mandate for Palestine. In the last hundred years, there seems to be no issue about the Syrian or the Iraqi mandate, but only about the Palestinian mandate to the British. Why do you believe that is? Well, there are a number of reasons why um, that issue has come up. Israel's adversaries have been trying to rob Israel of its legitimacy, of its right to exist. They use international history, they think, to their own advantage. But uh, I think now people will have to learn this history properly and not allow some professor or some um, media figure to distort what went on 100 years ago. Mm. 100 years ago, it was clear as day that the restoration of a Jewish national home was supported by the majority of countries in the world. That was essentially the essence of the Palestine Mandate of the League of Nations. And that reaffirmation of Jewish historical rights was retained by the United Nations in Article 80 of the UN Charter. So I think our people have to learn international history a little bit better and then use it on every occasion on television, in social media, and wherever that history can be told. Mm. You mentioned Article 80. Article 80 is actually pivotal, isn't it? And it's mentioned in the documentary as well to the status of the State of Israel. Well, what happened was you have the rights of the Jewish people to restore, to reconstitute their um, ancient homeland. And then somebody could say, well, wait a minute, those rights were granted by the League of Nations. By after World War II, a new body replaces the League. It's the United Nations. So maybe those resolutions from the League are irrelevant. The UN, when it was founded, recognized that arguments like that might be made. And therefore, they incorporated into the UN Charter, they incorporated Article 80 which basically said all, all of the rights in, that were recognized years ago that contain rights for the peoples of the Middle East and the rest of the world, those rights carry over to the UN period. So the rights that we have, which we can easily point to, um, are now part of modern history and not just ancient history. Hmm. Final question, Ambassador Gold. A uh, hundred years after the signing of the San Remo Resolution, uh, say you're back in, uh, at the UN yourself. What would you do to make sure that the San Remo Resolution was prominent in the minds and hearts of diplomats around the world? Well, the first thing you have to do is get a photocopy of it and make sure it's on the desk of every UN delegation. I used to do that when I was at the UN and uh, point out that this is how the world community viewed the rights of the Jewish people way back in 1920. And then show through Article 80 
that those rights were never uh, suffocated, were never removed, were never erased, but are there today and um, should be a guide for policy in the future. Ambassador Gold, appreciate your expertise very You're much. Welcome. Israeli ambassador to the UN Danny Danone was the keynote speaker at the 90th anniversary of the San Remo resolution. And earlier, I spoke with both Ambassador Danone and Thomas Sandel, founder of ECI, who organized that event 10 years ago. Ambassador Danny Danone, thanks for joining us. You were there 10 years ago at the 90th anniversary. I remember that well. What are your thoughts as you reflect on that event 10 years ago? 10 years ago, I had the honor to participate in the landmark event in San Remo. It was an amazing event. And I think we have to continue to tell the story about San Remo. It is important for our future. It is important for our present. I remember marching into the villa with my colleagues from all around the world, Europe, Israel, the US, Canada, Latin America, and we all shared the same belief that we have to tell to the world what happened in this important position, in this important place many years ago. We will continue to share the story of San Remo with our colleagues all around the world. Thomas, I remember you inviting me to cover that event uh, at the 90th anniversary. Why did you think it was so important to organize the 90th anniversary of the signing of the San Remo Resolution? Well, Chris, you remember 10 years ago, very few people outside of a small circle of academics uh, knew about the San Remo Resolution. And uh, when we discovered that this was the case and we were approaching the 90th anniversary, we knew that in order to raise awareness of this uh, landmark event in Jewish history, we needed to go to the original site in San Remo, in Villa de Vashan, uh, on the very date of the 90th anniversary in order to, uh, to make this a new story, which we managed to do, Chris, with your help. And um, this um, is important for two reasons. And I think it debunks two uh, uh, myths that are linked to the creation of the Jewish state. One is to say that, uh, and very popular in BDS and other circles of uh, enemies of Israel, to say that uh, the Jewish people came as uh, colonialists to this land and they stole it away from another people. Uh, false. The other narrative would say that uh, Israel was given to the Jewish people as a compensation for the collective uh, suffering that the Jewish people went through during the uh, Holocaust. False. Already several decades before the Holocaust, an in international treaty was signed in this place, in San Remo, on this very date. And uh, this is what gives uh, Israel legitimacy, and this is what uh, is the legal foundation of the Jewish state. Ambassador Danon, you're now at the epicenter of world affairs there at the United Nations, 10 years after being there in San Remo. How important is the signing of the San Remo Resolution as Israel takes its place among the nations? The San Remo Resolution is not known all around the world. We have to work harder. We have to create awareness for the resolution. Also in the United Nations, when I speak as Israeli representative to the UN with my colleagues, most of them, unfortunately, they don't know about the Remo resolution. Some of them recognize the Balfour Declaration. Some of them recognize the votes at the United Nations, but we have to start from the beginning. That is why it's so important to continue to raise the awareness for the San Remo Resolution, to have a discussion in the General Assembly, to invite ambassadors to understand what exactly happened, because this is the principle when you speak about international law, when you speak about our right for self-determination. Thomas, in your view, what has happened in between the 90th and the 100th anniversaries of the signing of the San Remo Resolution? Between these two uh, anniversaries, we have been quite busy reaching out to um, especially the um, 
countries that made up the Supreme Council of the Principal Allied Powers. And we've been to national parliaments uh, to all these nations, including Japan, which uh, was an interesting case because in Japan, nobody had ever heard about the San Remo resolution or that uh, Japan was part of these uh, uh, countries that signed the resolution. But in, even in Japan, they found the original San Remo resolution in Japanese in their archives. And uh, this is just one example how this was brought to the attention of the government of Japan for the first time ever, that they had played such a significant role in the uh, recreation of the state of uh, Israel. Uh, but we also been to um, uh, the European Parliament in Brussels, to other national parliaments, and even spoken to ambassadors in the UN Security Council in New York. So I think that these last uh, 10 years have uh, uh, we been able, uh, together with the international lawyers that we work together with, to raise more awareness of the importance of the San Remo Resolution. Ambassador Danone, what in your view are the pillars of Israel's right to the land? When I speak about Israel's right for self-determination, I speak about few pillars. The first and most important pillar is the biblical right to the land. We have the biblical right to the land. You just need to open the Bible and read about it. The Bible is our deed to the land. I advocate about it in the Security Council and I challenged my colleagues from the UN. I asked them, can you show me your deed to the land? Open the Bible and you will read about our biblical right to the land. After that, I speak a lot about the historical right to the land. You need to open the history books. You can look at the archeological excavations in Jerusalem and understand that we were always there in Israel. We never left that land. Nobody gave us anything. It belongs to us for centuries. The third is international law. Yes, according to international law, we have full rights to the land. We go back to San Remo Resolution, Balfour Declaration, UN resolutions. So when you combine all of those ideas together, the biblical right, the historical right, and international law, you understand why we, have, we don't have to apologize about our existence. And we are optimistic that in the near future, more and more countries will recognize Israel. Today, we have diplomatic relations with more than 160 countries around the world. And every day, we forge new relationships with new countries. I'm optimistic about it. But in order to secure our future, we have to learn our history. We have to go back to San Remo, we have to tell the stories. We have to share the information with the world. I want to thank you for sharing the story today. Thomas, as we look back to the 10 years, and now here we are in the 100th anniversary of the signing of the San Remo Resolution, where do we stand right now? Well, Chris, I think we are writing history today. On this 100th anniversary of the San Remo Resolution, for the first time ever, we have world leaders officially recognizing the importance of this landmark event. And um, as you have noted earlier in the program, we've had these letters from uh, some of the most uh, prominent leaders in the international community today, for the first time openly speaking about what happened here 100 years ago. So um, I think for the next 10 years, this will be a crucial element in the international debate to go beyond what happened uh, in the UN partition plan, what happened after the Holocaust, uh, and instead focus on uh, the prehistory and the agreements which were made under international law already in 1920. And I believe once we get the historical facts right, the legal facts right, we also have a better prospect for finding a peaceful solution in the Middle East region. Thank you, Ambassador Danone and Thomas. Britain played a key role in fostering the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine since the mandate was given to Britain. For Lord Simon Redding, this is not only a part of British history, but also a part of his family history. Ancestors on both sides of his family were instrumental in this process. 
the first Marquis of Reading was a member of the British War Cabinet, together with Lord Balfour and David Lloyd George. His great-grandfather on his mother's side is Alfred Mond, the first Baron Melchett, and a member of Parliament, who actually visited Palestine with Heim Weizmann already in 1921. He was one of the founders of the Jewish Agency, who later became actively involved in the rebuilding of Jewish Palestine. Today, you can find his name on the Israeli city Telmond, which he founded, and on street names bearing his name in many Israeli cities, including Tel Aviv. In an earlier interview on Revelation TV, he reflected on the history between the two nations, as well as Israeli-British relations today. Well, welcome to the program. And uh, today we have two very special guests uh, joining us. The first is uh, Lord Simon Redding, who is the fourth Marquis of Reading. It's a great honour for us to have uh, aristocracy mm -hmm. on, uh, on the Middle East report today. Uh, and when did the Lord place a real love for, for Israel uh, on your heart? Because you do have a, a Jewish yes. background, don't you? I do, yes. I'm nearly half Jewish. And my grandfather and grandmother were both Jewish. And in, in fact, I first of all came to Israel in 1993. And in 1993, uh, I was taken by Lady Sainsbury around um, Israel and then really fell in love with the land and uh, really rediscovered my Jewish roots, which I had sort of quietly forgotten about up until then. Amazing. Lord Redding, it was only three years ago that we all celebrated the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Balfour Declaration. Mm -hmm. um, and now, three years later, we are remembering the 100th anniversary of the San Remo Conference. In what way did this San Remo Conference and the agreement there actually implement the promise made to the Jewish people of a homeland through the Balfour Declaration? Right. So going back to the Balfour Declaration, uh, November the 2nd, 1917. And basically, it was a letter written um, by Lord Balfour on behalf of the cabinet to Lord Rothschild, uh, granting a homeland to the Jews. So this is really just a letter of intent. What happened was three years later, it was ratified, legitimized by the Treaty of San Remo, where there were four central powers representing 51 nations. And the four powers were Italy, obviously San Remo, um, Britain, France, and rather unusually Japan. So it was through uh, the treaty that it, it really legitimized um, the Balfour Declaration and made it um, into international law. Lord Redding, we, we have to really discuss the fact that uh, the pr uh, Prime Minister uh, David Lloyd George, who was the Prime Minister of the signing of the Balfour Declaration, mm. he was also representing the British Empire at the San Marino mm. Conference, um, very much personally wanted to support the re-establishment of the State of Israel mm. uh, and the Jewish people. First of all, it's interesting to look at the Cabinet in 1917. There, were, there was Lloyd George, of course, who in fact was influenced very much by the Welsh Revival. Um, there was Balfour, who himself was a Plymouth Brethren. There were Jews like my other great-grandfather, um, uh, Sir Alfred Mond. So it was a combination of evangelicals and Jewish influence, which was behind the Balfour Declaration. 20 years later, uh, they were losing the uh, uh, original vision. And in fact, uh, Churchill mentioned this on two or three occasions in the House of Commons, that they'd started well, but were losing the thread. In, in terms of relations between Britain and Israel now, those relations are flourishing, aren't they, particularly after kind of Brexit as well, that uh, Israeli investment in the British economy is huge and vice versa. Yes. Uh, Israeli military and security cooperation with, his, with Britain and Israel has never been stronger. Do you think, in your opinion, we've seen a repair, repair of that breach 70 years on from the treatment of the Jewish people during the mandate years? Yeah. I think there's a gradual, it's a step-by-step -step process. And it does come, of course, from the Foreign Office. And I think Jeremy Hunt, 
the previous foreign secretary, uh, was the person who really led the way. And I remember going to the Foreign Office and hearing him speak about um, his experience of uh, some of the death camps. And it moved him very considerably. And of course, now we have Dominic Raab, whose father was a Holocaust survivor. So it, it's just gently shifting the policy towards Israel. And as you say, there are other indications. Trade, in, trade is flourishing, and there's an enormous amount of co cooperation, and especially coming out of the EU, uh, I believe the two countries will get um, far closer together. I think we can rectify it by building up relationships between the two countries, individuals, that um, there should be um, more uh, uh, interaction, particularly, I, I believe, at, um, at student level too. There should be more interchange of students. Um, and uh, generally speaking, we should be um, uh, getting together, seeing each other more often. For many years, as the international community discussed the solution to the Middle East conflict, the San Remo Resolution was mainly forgotten. However, on the 100th anniversary, a number of governments have sent their personal messages to this occasion. It illustrates how the landmark event is no longer just a side note in world history, but a significant event to be considered for any future peace agreement. It's also the first time San Remo has been recognized in official documents by some of these countries. Here are some of those messages. <music> President of the State of Israel, Reuven Rivlin, it gives me the greatest pleasure to write to you as you gather to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the San Remo Conference held at Castello de Vachan. There are few more seminal moments in the history of the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. Holding a conference to mark its centenary is an important reminder. I believe that now, 100 years later, we have an opportunity to make changes that will create a new Middle East, a region of stability, prosperity, security, and liberty for all peoples, whatever their beliefs, languages, and cultures. I wish you much success in your conference and send you warmest greetings from Jerusalem. President of the Czech Republic, Milo Siman, I would like to thank the European Coalition for Israel and the Forum for Cultural Diplomacy for the important work supporting the State of Israel. I am very pleased to be able to contribute to the publication commemorating the 100th anniversary of San Remo Resolution, which has fundamentally changed the modern history of the Jewish people. Thanks to the Balfour Declaration, which is an inseparable part of the San Remo Resolution, Jewish people obtained their Magna Carta and a possibility to return to their homeland after nearly 2,000 years of life in the diaspora. Although the Jewish people had to wait for the establishment of the State of Israel until 1948, the San Remo Conference was a crucial moment for the beginning of building such a successful country. I am convinced that the bonds between the Czech Republic and the State of Israel will keep strong. Allow me to express my honest pleasure and congratulations to the State of Israel celebrating the 100th anniversary of San Remo Resolution and getting the right to return to the Holy Land. Prime Minister of Italy, Giuseppe Conti. One of the seeds of this olive tree that would become the symbol of the Israeli national identity was in fact planted in Italy in San Remo 100 years ago. The San Remo Final Resolution incorporated the 1917 Balfour Declaration into international law, confirming its support to the creation of a national home for the Jewish people, without prejudice of the rights of the non-Jewish communities in Palestine. On the 100th anniversary of the conference, Italy remembers its commitment to Israel and the great friendship that binds our two countries and peoples. Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia. This April marks 100 years since the passing of the San Remo Resolution in 1920. Australia maintains close ties with the countries of the region that gained their independence in the decades that followed. 
Here in Australia, we cherish our enduring friendship with Israel. We were among the first to recognize the new nation in 1948. And during that formative time, our then Prime Minister, Ben Shifley, claimed that Israel would be a force of special value in the world community. Today, Australia and Israel's relationship continues unbroken, supported by the Australian Jewish community, which has done so much to shape our country for the better. I wish the people of Israel peace and prosperity in the years to come. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. 100 years ago today, the principal allied powers of Europe and Asia assembled in San Remo, Italy, and declared themselves committed to putting into effect the Balfour Declaration in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. That historic agreement marked the world's embrace of the unbreakable connection of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, an enduring constant from the time of patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the reigns of King David and Solomon, across the age of Jesus of Nazareth, and throughout the subsequent period of exile and dispersion. No country has done more to honor the spirit of the Balfour Declaration and the San Remo Resolution than the United States of America. The 100th anniversary in April is passing, but as the Israeli ambassador to Italy and the founder of ECI, Thomas Sandel, explain, it's only the beginning of an important year ahead. Just before a small virus turned the world upside down, I had the opportunity to visit San Remo in early February. We at the Israeli embassy in Italy planned to hold a major event marking the centenary of the conference together with the European Coalition for Israel and World Zionist Organization with the participation of leaders from Italy and around the world. Anyone who studies closely the resolution adopted at the conference knows Contrary to some widespread misconceptions heard in today's world, international law stands firmly on the side of Israel and its policies. I visited the archives of the Italian Foreign Ministry and my eye caught a telegram sent to the Italian Prime Minister at the time, Francesco Nitti, who participated in the Sanremo hearings. Quote, hope the Supreme Council will settle the Palestine question in accordance with the Balfour Declaration, signed Community Achim Neemonim and Rabbi Benjamin Cohen from El Paso, Texas. We saw many such telegrams and learned about the tense anticipation of the Jewish world and the importance of the conference at, the point, at that point in history. A hundred years have passed and here we are again in a world war this time against an invisible enemy which threatens humanity with an infectious disease. The epidemic has disrupted our plans. The big event has been postponed and will be held in San Remo, hopefully on November 2nd, the day of the Balfour Declaration. How symbolic. I expect you will hear a lot this evening about the historic conference. Let me stress just one point. The Balfour Declaration is more famous than any other document in Zionist historiography, except perhaps Israel's Declaration of Independence. But it was a non-binding declaration. The San Remo Resolution transformed it into international law and gave it the force of a legal instrument. In fact, on April 25th, 1920, for the first time since the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century, the nations of the world recognized our legal title to the land of Israel, which was then known as Palestine or Palestina since Emperor Hadrian changed its name in order to try to break the connection between the Jews and Judea and between the people of Israel and the land of Israel. The international community accepted the request of the Zionist movement to reconstitute what we once had. That is why Chaim Weizmann defines San Remo as the most momentous political event 
in the whole history of the Zionist movement, and it is perhaps no exaggeration to say in the whole history of our people since the exile. In fact, of all the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and more, 99% was given to the Arabs and 1% to the Jews. For some reason, only that 1% is being put into question. In the centuries before the conference, Palestine was a remote province in the Ottoman Empire. American writer Mike Twain visited there in 1867 and described it as a land which sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its fields and fettered its energies. Unknowingly, he echoed the biblical curse verses from Leviticus, and I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. Palestine was not a territorial gift to any ruler, as was the case with other territories in the Middle East. British Prime Minister Lloyd George, who stayed at the Villa de Vauchon in San Remo uh, all that fateful week, as well as Lord James Valfour, were both God-fearing Christians. They were Zionist Christians, which means they believe in the biblical prophecies of the return of the Jews to Zion and wanted to help fulfill them and to bring about the resurrection of the Jewish nation in the Holy Land, thereby bringing justice to our suffering people. Darkness and light alternate in our long history. At certain moments of grace, we received the support of the nations. Most of the time, we had to fight for our most basic rights. The war against the Jewish people, against its existence, culture, and beliefs has taken many shapes. Throughout history, we have become familiar with anti-Semitism based on differences in belief. In the last century, we have become aware of a new anti-Semitism, opposition to the Jewish nationalism. This anti-Semitism seeks to delegitimize the very existence of our state often focusing on the claim that Israel's presence in Samaria and Judea, the cradle of our ancient civilization, and even Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem, contravene international law? Well, the answer is in the San Remo Resolution. At the root of this war against the State of Israel is the war against the return of the Jews to history and to their land. In a long-standing historical perspective, this aspect is no less significant than the political and military interest which stood at the basis of the various treaties. When it comes to our return to Zion, the world must choose which side of history it is on. In April 1920, in San Remo, the positive forces of the time chose the right side of history and established the legal and political basis upon which, exactly 28 years later, by the Hebrew date, the State of Israel was established. Well, I want to thank you, Chris, for hosting the program today on this exceptional day, the 100th anniversary of the San Remo Resolution. But let us remember that uh, this is only the beginning of a centenary year. And as an organization, European Coalition for Israel, we hope to soon return to San Remo, the original site of the signing of the resolution, uh, not only in support of the legal rights of the Jewish people to the land, but also in, in uh, solidarity with the Italian people who have suffered so much in the last few weeks. And, uh, but still have shown such a warm commitment to celebrating this landmark event together with us. So uh, as soon as uh, the situation will permit, we are committed to returning to San Remo and again remember what happened there 100 years ago as the legal rights of the Jewish people were codified under international law. And that was indeed a landmark event.
Finally, here's an important message from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on this special anniversary. My dear friends, the centennial anniversary of the Sanremo Conference is a chance to celebrate a seminal moment in the history of Zionism. At Sanremo, the victorious Allied powers of World War I recognized the Jewish people's right of self-determination. Those powers ratified and pledged to implement the Balfour Declaration. Three years earlier, British Foreign Minister Lord Arthur Balfour, speaking on behalf of his government, had called for the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Now, in ratifying that historic declaration, San Remo recognized a fundamental truth. The Jewish people are not foreign colonialists in the land of our forefathers. The land of Israel is our ancestral homeland. My friends, for decades I've been fighting those who have sought to deny the millennial connection of the Jewish people to our homeland. I'm proud to say that the decades-long struggle has borne fruit. Three months ago, the Trump peace plan recognized Israel rights in all of Judea and Samaria. And President Trump pledged to recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Jewish communities there and in the Jordan Valley. A couple of months from now, I'm confident that that pledge will be honored, that we will be able to celebrate another historic moment in the history of Zionism. A century after San Remo, the promise of Zionism is being realized. It's being realized because we never stop fighting for our rights, and your efforts are part of that fight. Thank you for celebrating this historic occasion. Thank you for fighting for the rights of the Jewish people. Thank you for working to help secure the Jewish future. Thank you so much for joining us on this special program on the anniversary of the signing of the San Remo Resolution. As you have seen and heard, it is the centerpiece of Israel's right to the land under international law. It's also the hope of many that the leaders of the world will recognize this historic event where Israel took its rightful place among the nations. We end this program with another hope, the anthem of the Jewish state and the cry of the Jewish people throughout the ages, Hatikva, the hope.